Hi, right, so this is uh, January 15th. We're inter interviewing Joanne Malone. This is Mike Tabor. I'm here with Ann Gallivan at the Institute for Policy Studies, January 15th. Um, so, Joanne, you were a nun who became a federal felon protesting against the Vietnam War. Where did you get your radical ideas? Well, Mike, before I answer your question, I would just like to thank you and Ann and all of the people here at the Institute for Policy Studies and uh, George Washington University for giving me this opportunity to speak to young people in the future. Um, and it's wonderful that today is Martin Luther King's birthday and also uh, my good friend Susie Salf from Earth Onion. So I dedicate this to both of them. Um, to answer your question, how did uh, nice girl from Kansas City, Missouri, uh, become uh, a radical nun and a federal felon. Um, it, uh, it really starts with uh, the Sisters of Loretto. Um, I was, uh, this is a picture of my prom from, uh, <laughs> Please, hold on, will you do that once again? Do you want me to, to show each one. So if, you, if you're going to show something, move it up just under your um, head. OK. So uh, this is a, a prom picture from 1958. Um, I saved the money from working to, uh, to get that dress. I remember it well. But um, my options as a 17-year-old were to either get married or go to the convent. It's a little hard to explain to young people today, but it really was true. And uh, I'm very deeply grateful that I ended up with the most progressive religious order in the United States, perhaps in the world at the time, the Sisters of Loretto. And uh, they took the basic Christian values that I was raised with to a whole new level of teaching us that Love is not an abstraction, but something that really has to be lived in our daily lives and all our actions and extend to all people in the world. So um, <clears throat> this is a picture of me uh, as a postulant and a novice. I was at their mother house in Kentucky uh, for three years and finally was uh, professed as a nun and stayed with the order for almost 12 years. Um, the leadership of the order at the time included uh, Sister Luke Tobin, who was the only woman invited to Vatican II. Uh, she came back and talked to us and explained about this uh, opening in the church that included social action, um, fighting against poverty and war and oppression. Uh, she was a very good friend of Thomas Merton's, uh, who lived uh, just seven miles away from our mother house and came and visited us and talked with us in small groups, which was amazing. He was another radical. Um, this is uh, another one of Sister Luke's books. And so some of our nuns, um, some good friends of mine, were part of liberation theology in South America. I had friends in Chile, uh, Bolivia, Peru, and they really became part of uh, revolutionary movements there. So I heard firsthand from them what it was like to be uh, poor and deprived of land in South America. Um, we studied books like Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire, um, many, many other uh, radical uh, teachers from around the world. And uh, after Vatican II, the Sisters of Loretto took a position that each sister should be able to act in conscience to eradicate poverty, to
to oppose war. So um, I really wasn't that different from my classmates. Uh, the big difference is probably that I, I participated in an action that uh, got me five federal felonies and faced 35 years in jail. What, when, at what point did the theories become political action? Well, my first teaching assignment was in Montgomery, Alabama in 1963, which you will remember was the year that the four little girls were bombed and killed in Birmingham. Uh, just a few years after Martin Luther King had had the bus boycott in uh, Montgomery, where I lived. And I was assigned to a small, all-white Catholic diocesan school. There were about 350 students. There was also an all-black school, 150 students. Made no sense at all to, for them to be segregated. So I um, started a baseball team, an integrated baseball team. and. Some of the parents had issues with that. Um, but seeing the segregation um, and the effect on both the black students and the white students um, deeply changed my heart and made me realize that I had grown up with the same kind of segregation in Kansas City, just without the signs. Um, so I came out of that year uh, a revolutionary uh, and have been dedicated to ending racism ever since. So, so where did you go after Alabama? Well, what were you doing from 1960 to 1975? Um, I was sent back um, to Kansas City to teach in my own high school. I taught my first cousin religion uh, uh, from 1964 to 1967. Then I was moved to St. Louis, another Catholic girls' school from 67 to 69, which is the year I did the Dow action. And um, was on trial uh, here in DC in 1970. And in 1971, I moved here permanently and have lived here in the area ever since. Well, how did you get involved in the anti-war movement? Well, um, back in Kansas City, I really wanted to go on the Selma uh, march in 65. Uh, friends of mine were able to go, but I wasn't. So I plunged into work in the inner city. Uh, we set up a storefront called Brown's. I, brought my students from the suburbs downtown and they encountered poverty that they had never seen before. Um, I worked very closely with some Christian brothers. They had um, a boys school, a military academy, uh, and we did retreats with the kids, joints retreats, but some of the boys were being drafted into the army. Uh, some of my students in Alabama had already been killed in Vietnam. Uh, this was the era of the Pentagon protests, of uh, the Black Panther Party rising up, of riots in, in Watts and Newark and elsewhere. Um, back then, we really saw uh, a great deal of the war in Vietnam on television body counts every single night. Um, and so naturally, we got involved with SDS and the college campuses, um, with um, <clears throat> uh, draft protests. Um, in St. Louis, um, I was involved with the Black Liberators, which was um, the local Black Panther Party, and uh, led a group of 60 nuns um, to the police headquarters when they had arrested two of the leaders for 
insufficiently lighted license plates at two o'clock in the afternoon uh, on a clear day. And um, after beating them viciously, accused them of attacking policemen. And these were two men I knew very, very well, not stupid. And uh, so we did get them released, uh, which, which was wonderful. Um, <clears throat> I also heard then in 67 about the Baltimore Four, one of the first uh, blood pouring actions on draft files by Phil Berrigan. The two events that I would say really pushed me toward taking a similar action were first hearing Thich Nhat Hanh speak in St. Louis in 1968. Um, this young Vietnamese monk uh, told in very vivid language uh, of the devastation of his country, of bombs that uh, uh, destroyed villages, left children orphans, of many close friends of his who had been killed in the war, including some uh, young people in the School of Social Work who were lined up and shot uh, for the kind of work that they were doing. He didn't take sides with either the North or the South. He wanted peace. So he was not a favorite of the government. Um, and what I remember vividly was a heckler in the audience who kept saying, if you're from Vietnam, the war is in Vietnam, you should go back to Vietnam. And uh, he took a breath, and probably calmed himself, and um, addressed this man, and with incredible compassion said, the war is like a tree. The leaves are in Vietnam. The roots of the war are here in the United States. And I've come here to water seeds of peace on the roots of the war. And he just blew me away. Uh, he's my meditation teacher today. Um, the second event, um, by this time, I had participated in some planning meetings for draft actions, uh, travel to the East Coast. And one of my very best friends uh, who had been involved in this with me uh, was a member of the Catonsville Nine. So when David Darst uh, joined Phil and Dan Berrigan and, and the other six in the Catonsville Nine, um, I was kind of at that point, we talked about it on the Catholic left as putting your life on the line. And my decision to do the action really was that. I was willing to give my life to stop the war. So, so what happened in the DC-9 action? Well, uh, nine of us, uh, five priests, um, an ex-nun, an ex-priest, they were married. Um, a regular draft resistor guy from Detroit, and me, um, and my little claim to fame is being the first nun in the United States to commit a federal felony and get prosecuted for it, um, entered the lobbying offices of the Dow Chemical Company, a very short distance from this building, 15th and L Street in DC. and. Uh, we went in on a day the office was closed, so there were no people in the office. Uh, we were completely nonviolent in our civil disobedience. Uh, we had no intention of hurting any people or scaring them or anything. Um, and uh, we basically trashed the office. We had had our own blood extracted and it was poured on some of the office equipment and files. And then we threw files uh, out the window and had supporters below 
uh, to gather them and make sure that the best uh, got published in the New York Times and the Washington Post. Um, one document that I remember really well was a five-year plan for Dow Chemical continuing to make napalm, nerve gas, and defoliants uh, for the war in Vietnam. So part of our action was aimed at showing the link between the government's decisions to carry out war and companies like Dow Chemical that profited from the war, uh, that it was really an imperialist capitalist war. Um, and um, there was supposed to be a draft action uh, coupled with ours. But um, unfortunately, there must have been some sort of leak and uh, the night before that action, uh, I watched it. Um, the uh, building where the draft files were kept was cleared out. Mm. And so that action couldn't happen. So you were charged and taken to jail? Yes, we were. Uh, we purposely stayed around to be arrested. Uh, I remember like 30 cops or something, but when I went back to the uh, archives to look at the transcripts, I, it was only a few. Um, but it was pretty scary. They had guns drawn and all that sort of thing. Um, Kathy Melville and I were taken to uh, DC Women's Detention at 1010 North Capitol Street. It's not there any longer. And uh, the men to the DC jail. And being in DC jail was quite an experience. Um, there were protesters outside uh, supporting us. Um, some of the women had lots of questions about what these, you know, two nun and an ex-nun were doing in jail. And um, uh, we were there for eight to ten days. Uh, we fasted the whole time. They offered to uh, force eggs down our nose if we didn't do what they wanted. And uh, this was um, a very important period for me because I realized how important writing was to me. It was harder for me not to have a pen and paper <laughs> than it was to not have a toothbrush. Mm -hmm. And uh, after a couple of days, I used paper towels. Somebody gave me a pencil, and I started a journal in prison, in jail, that I've kept most of the time ever since. So, so how did you get out of jail? Well, um, uh, we were given court-appointed lawyers. Uh, Edward Bennett Williams was one of them, Phil Hirschkopf, Addie Bowman, and others. And uh, were charged with five federal felonies burglary to destruction of property to the building, to the, the office, to the equipment, um, conspiracy. And um, I, we were facing 35 possible years of federal time each. Um, we actually, uh, I'll tell the rest of that story later, but but ended up being on the equivalent of probation for a total of seven years. But, well, when and where was the trial? Um, the trial uh, took place in Washington, D.C., Superior Court, on February 3rd to 10th, 1970. And um, the uh, uh, I went through these transcripts, as I, I noted. Um, I was writing a book at the time on, on the trial and the action. Um, we were finally convicted of four of the five federal felonies. Uh, conspiracy is apparently difficult to prove. So we were not convicted on conspiracy. And um, the trial was very intense, very emotional. Um, so two members, after a couple of days, uh, felt they could not continue going through with it. Um, 
actually Kathy and Bernie, the two decided to uh, plead guilty and ended up still having federal felonies on their record and served more time than the rest of us did in the end. Um, once we were sentenced, the rest of us, um, most people got three years, two of us, including myself, got four, and Art Melville got six. I think it was based on how obstreperous we were in the courtroom, basically. Um, and um, in 1973, um, we won our appeal. So it was based on the right to defend ourselves. We had fired our lawyers. We're not allowed to speak on key things in the trial, such as our purpose for doing it. Like, we couldn't talk about Dow Chemical, napalm, nerve gas, defoliants, the war in Vietnam, uh, why we did this uh, to try to stop the war. And so we were offered either a new trial or one misdemeanor. And of course, by then, I was a mother. Um, the two Jesuits wanted a new trial, but I pushed very strongly to plead guilty to the one misdemeanor. And uh, if we hadn't done that, uh, I wouldn't have been able to teach and have another 20-year teaching career. Did your religious order support you during that trial? Amazing. The Sisters of Loretto were phenomenal. Um, the statements they had issued about a sister being able to act according to her conscience, they stood by that. Um, there's actually a, um, a chapter in this book, More Than a Renewal, by Helen Saunders that addresses uh, my action and the order's position on it. Uh, it's called Chapter 17, Conflicting Values Surface. And in it, um, a quote, for instance, from Sister Luke, the, the uh, superior general of our order, Conscious of the Christian imperative, we have chosen to walk a difficult path. And it goes on to explain how important it is for us to be able to act according to our conscience. Uh, on the other hand, I'm sure some nuns in the order were horrified. And the people that expressed that horror were mostly the parents of the students that I taught back in Nerex Hall High School in St. Louis. Uh, they held protests, they um, screamed at us in the hallways. Uh, they basically shut the, the school down for about three days. And so um, I ended up uh, deciding to, um, There are a lot of things I forgot to show you. <laughs> um, to step down uh, from my teaching position, and there are some articles that uh, I can show you later, but uh, in this one, it talks about a press conference that was held uh, where I was strongly supported by Helen Saunders, my provincial and uh, I made a decision myself to withdraw from the classroom so that the school could continue to function. And of course, uh, it did give me the opportunity to travel and speak and organize other actions. Uh, and the next year, I was slated to um, begin a PhD program uh, in sociology at the New School in New York. So, you know, for all practical purposes, that was the end of my first teaching career. So, so in 1971, you moved to the Washington, D.C. area. What, what did you get involved in in, in Washington, D.C.? 
Uh, there are so many things that if you tried to make me make a list that was complete, I'm sure I couldn't do it. But uh, the big ones, I uh, was sort of rescued by Earth Onion, Women's Improvisational Theater. And um, I hope that you do an interview with them too. Uh, uh, we're still very close friends. Uh, we created theater, uh, traveled up and down the East Coast, did a tour at Chicago, uh, Fort Bragg, um, on stories based on our own experiences and asked for ideas from the audience, oftentimes, for pieces that people would like to see performed. Um, I lived with Art and Irene Wasco uh, I worked with Arthur here at the Institute for Policy Studies for about a year and a half, worked on a prison project, um, held a conference in Chicago, and uh, produced a special edition of Off Our Backs, the women's newspaper. I was, of course, pretty interested in the issue of prison since I still had a four-year sentence hanging over my head at the time. Um, one, uh, uh, and during that time, any small infraction, jaywalking, could have gotten us locked up. I mean, we were under very strict provisions not to be doing anything the judge didn't want us to do. Um, uh, I did, of course, in fact, organize some other actions I'm really proud of. Uh, but. Uh, one of the things that we did in D.C. was to form a commune so that uh, for the precise purpose of taking care of my child when I went to prison. And I'm deeply grateful to my friends for, uh, for that and for many friends that helped me care for him so that I could work uh, and continue in the movement. Um, in the 1971 to 75 period, I also joined a study group. Um, some of you here in the room, I believe, participated in similar studies of socialism. And um, this um, very much attracted me because by this time I had left the Catholic Church in 67, uh, three years before I left the order. Long story, but um, uh, I also pretty much separated from the Catholic left um, over issues of sexism and lack of security and seriousness about social change. Um, there was a lot of ego involved. I'm sure I participated in that too. But uh, I wanted uh, real revolutionary change. So uh, some of the groups that I worked with were the DC Unite to Fight Back. Um, we did a lot of housing, um, fairness work, and uh, support of people on trials. Um, the US-China People's Friendship Association uh, and there was a, a big campaign uh, to free Terrence Johnson that um, I was heavily involved in. Uh, he was a young African-American man, 15 years old, that was arrested. He hadn't done anything, actually. Uh, uh, and in a, a scuffle where uh, uh, a policeman was beating him in a side room with his gun on his holster. Uh, the gun went off and it ended up killing two policemen in a Hyattsville jail. And I saw this on television and said, this kid is going to die tonight in that jail if we don't do something. And um, so we quickly rallied, the fight back did got lawyers for him, uh, supported his family during the trial. Um, there um, were also many jobs in 
factories, a little hard to find in the D.C. area, but we managed. Um, and uh, Georgetown University Hospital was one of the places I worked to help form a union. Um, I was very excited. I got fired over that, but uh, it did eventually happen. So it was a great victory. Um, and my life was by this time really dedicated to revolution. Uh, the only limits on various things that I was involved in were the fact that I was a mother and a single mother I needed to provide for and take care of my child. And secondly, because we wanted uh, long-term, deep social change, getting arrested on minor charges for a protest or something uh, didn't make sense most of the time. So we had to be careful and selective about what we did. And um, we're really trying to build a different kind of world, a world where peace and love were possible. Um, and, and community was very important to you. Yeah, um, uh, community is a, a theme, I think, that goes throughout my life as I was reflecting on this and thinking about what I wanted to say. Um, I went right from a family, uh, dysfunctional alcoholism, into the Sisters of Loretto, a powerful community that taught me women could do anything. <laughs> it was the equivalent of an international corporation. We had our own universities. And, um, and um, then the communities that we formed in DC um, were amazing. Uh, we, we had alternate newspapers. We had great bookstores. We had uh, uh, houses uh, dedicated to uh, social action and union organizing. It, it was an amazing period. And community is still very, very important in my life. I spend a lot of my time in uh, working in two primary communities today. So, so how did it feel to be part of the anti-war movement and other movements of the 60s? Well, I loved it when you posed this question as one of the main ones because uh, it felt fantastic. <laughs> it was, looking back on it, one of the most amazing periods of my life. Um, some of us, um, it wasn't just a joke about turning 30 and seeing ourselves as old people. We, uh, we really had that youthful uh, fire that uh, we were willing to die to stop the war. I mean, we had seen a lot of death. Uh, from way back when it was my students being drafted to Vietnam, um, meeting Thich Nhat Hanh, meeting other revolutionary people who had been imprisoned, tortured, killed. It, um, and once, once we had done something like the Dow action and had been on the other side, uh, there was no going back for me. And, and, and there, there was camaraderie. Yeah, deep, deep camaraderie. I mean, we lived together, we made mistakes together, we got in trouble together, we, we uh, supported one another. I mean, the fact that there are, what, five of you sitting in this room right now that I knew back in those days, and we're still, we like each other, you know, we have common interests today is, is just amazing. Um, one of the, the feelings was that we were beginning everything anew 
And this might be a common feeling for many young people, but we were supported by revolutions happening in Africa, revolutions in Latin America, in Central America, uh, China. I mean, it was, it, we were connected to a worldwide movement. So it felt as if we were on the edge of this chasm and behind me was the old patriarchal sexist church I had been raised in. Um, the government, the CIA, the mean and nasty corporations, <laughs> the power structures. And on the other, you know, we were building something new, a new world. But, and, <laughs> but the expectation is that we would have gotten married. Oh, <laughs> not me. Um, back to the prom picture. <laughs> Uh, I love having that because um, I really uh, am so happy that I made the choice I made. I, I probably would have killed some poor guy by the time I had five children and was <laughs> 21 years old. Um, but also, uh, many of us saw marriage as a form of slavery. And uh, I actually didn't acknowledge that the relationship I was in was what most people would call a marriage until I was 53 years old. Um, I, uh, I had pretty strong views on that subject back in the day. So, so do you think your actions hindered or helped you? Good question. Um, it definitely uh, helped me be the person I am today. Um, I've always been very proud of having been in the DC-9 action. Um, I'm proud of the work that we, we did in DC. Um, it, it gave me a sort of instant credentials with the Black Panther Party, with the Chicano movement, with radical feminists, with you know, all sorts of revolutionary groups because um, they knew I was at least serious and dedicated and willing to risk my life for what I believed in. Um, the, uh, this thing about crossing lines, um, you know, a, a lot of us, at various times had to do all sorts of things to live, to make money, uh, to make compromises. Um, but you can't get a federal job, you know, when you've committed all those federal felonies. It just, I think I tried to fill out a 171 form <laughs> once and gave up <laughs> midway through. So um, I was very lucky to get a job uh, with uh, Montgomery County eventually, but uh, I was eight months on the job and they somehow discovered these felonies on my record and said, you're gone. And it took digging through these dirty old boxes of files down in Suitland, Maryland <laughs> to find the one piece of paper that showed that our felonies were reduced to one misdemeanor. Apparently the FBI still had felonies on our record. So um, I'm, I'm happy that I was able to uh, continue my teaching career, but not everybody uh, was able to do that. One priest in one of the actions got uh, nine years of federal time, hard time. So, so in terms of the visions you had and the beliefs you had, how did it change your life? How did it affect your life? And, and how did it affect the lives of uh, uh, your children? Um, I think um, even in difficult times, I have been able uh, to maintain this vision of peace. Um, if we don't have a vision 
of a possible peaceful world without discrimination, oppression, national boundaries even, then we'll never create it. And I am so pleased that so many of our children um, have gone on to take the type of actions that we did then, not necessarily using our tactics, which aren't appropriate necessarily for the times, but uh, are deeply involved in the anti-nuke movement back in the, in the 80s. Uh, and today in the ongoing um, movement to try to save our planet and environmental work. So um, uh, many of them in our community are carrying on the work to stop racism and poverty and war and to save our planet. And that, that just uh, gives me a uh, great hope for the future. And, and you were an inspiration, I imagine, for those children you taught. Well, I, I was very, very lucky uh, to get this 20-year teaching career in D.C. and Maryland. Um, and uh, some of the things we got to do, I was describing to folks earlier, was to build a peaceful schools program at Wilson High School in D.C. So. I trained over a thousand students, um, usually at least 50 a year, uh, new, new people, uh, to lead a very powerful diversity workshop program on stereotyping of racism. I got to teach peace studies somewhere here. I have uh, Coleman McCarthy's book, I'd Rather Teach Peace. Uh, uh, he gets the credit for making it possible for peace studies to be a regular elective. It still is in the Montgomery County public school system. And he and his son and um, a team of people at Wilson and again at Blair uh, worked together to, to build powerful programs that made it possible for students to really get involved and one of the actions, I'm not sure, Mike, if your son was there at the time, but uh, in 2003 uh, at Montgomery Blair, where I taught, 2,600 students did a walkout to try to stop the bombing of Iraq. And it was very powerful to watch. It was student-led and organized with little support from some of us. Um, but they walked in freezing rain for hour after hour, carrying signs, lots of television coverage. It, um, along with eight million people around the world that were protesting the bombing of Iraq. Because uh, one of the realities which I can see, I have some very close friends who were veterans of uh, the Vietnam War, who still, to this day, suffer from Agent Orange, which Dow Chemical made, um, from PTSD, from drug and alcohol addiction that, that were based in that war. A war um, is not something a government can stop and start. You know, my son, while he was a student of yours, uh, was arrested at an anti-IMF World Bank demonstration with other students from your high school. So, um, so today you're spending time working on transforming the violence that we've created and wrecked upon the world. Ah, uh, yes. Um, some of of the, uh, the things that uh, are going on now uh, that are exciting to me, uh, I am very pleased to be in my seventh decade and uh, to have lived through some of the great social movements of the 20th and 21st century. 
to see an African American president is so wonderful to me. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of electoral politics, uh, but sometimes there are things that that are, are worth getting out there and putting some energy behind, and that was one. Um, I hope to see a woman president in the White House um, before I die. <laughs> Maybe not right now. Um, and uh, uh, many, many changes have happened. I mean, we all know uh, some of my young women students um, envision themselves doing fantastic things in the world that were not even possible to conceive when I was 17 years old. And I'm very happy about that. Um, but some of the movements that we were involved in, the women's movement, um, the civil rights movement, uh, seem, you know, sometimes to have been deeply affected by reactionary forces in our, our society, by the government, um, and steps backwards happen that are, can be very confusing. <laughs> um, but it's also life, you know. Uh, in some ways, uh, people would call me an idealist, I suppose. And, um, and I have to, to really see things as they are. But um, one of the ones that disturbs me greatly is that um, the Black Panther Party in uh, 1965 tried to expose the issue of police brutality, particularly toward uh, young black men. This is a power to the people button um, with the Elridge Cleaver. And 50 years, and it still uh, seems like a new issue. Um, I'm very happy that the Washington Post has been doing a series on the extent of police killings, um, the militarization of our police forces. So um, one thing I'm, I'm happy that many of my friends are involved in are the NRA demonstrations. Um, uh, we went in December on the anniversary of Sandy Hook and friends gather at the White House every Monday from uh, 11 to 1, you can join them. Uh, so there are a lot of really good things like that that are still going on. So, so as a person of wisdom, uh, <laughs> do you have a message to young people today that you'd like to state for us? Whew. Sure. Uh, <laughs> I guess. Uh, uh, I got 20 years in a classroom teaching uh, social studies, so, um, so so I'm I'm very grateful for that for that opportunity to speak to young people. But some of my uh, my messages were to um, even back when I was speaking around the country at colleges and to the press. Number one. I would say live your life, live it fully with gusto. <laughs> um, so many of us uh, get trapped in boxes, you know, in jobs, in relationships, in um, situations where uh, where we feel caught and oppressed, and. Um, Keeping our minds and our spirits alive is, is work that, uh, to, to really live in the present moment, knowing that all this history is part of what makes us who we are, but that our present actions also affect future generations um, is, is very important to me. So. Uh, I've gotten involved in uh, mindful 
mindfulness meditation. I mentioned Thich Nhat Hanh as my teacher. Um, and this, uh, this helps me really look deeply at myself and my own suffering and in transforming that suffering, um, helping to reach out to other people. Uh, I didn't mention that um, travel has been something very important to me. Um, uh, I couldn't travel for a long time because of the probation restrictions and courts and that kind of thing. Um, but since becoming a teacher, um, everybody seemed to feel sorry for DC teachers, so we got all kinds of grants and I got a Fulbright to China. And, um, I was privileged to go on a trip with Thich Nhat Hanh back to Vietnam. He had been exiled for 39 years. And this little pendant, which uh, I'll ask Getty to do a, a close-up of later, um, I got at the top of Yente Mountain, which uh, they told me he was up there in front of me someplace climbing. but. Um, it, it was awesome to, uh, to be able to travel to Vietnam on a very meaningful trip uh, with uh, a teacher who carried that same message I heard him carry in 1968 back to his people. It was very powerful. So uh, a second thing I would urge young people to do is find the very best teachers and artists that you can possibly find in the world to uh, learn from. Read um, uh, and become the best teachers and best artists and best people that you can be. Um, follow your dreams, uh, travel, uh, see what other people in other countries um, are doing, what they're thinking, what they're feeling, uh, what their needs are. Uh, we are so incredibly privileged in this country that I, I really need to get out <laughs> uh, every few years and see what conditions are like in Cambodia, which barely has rule of law and devastated by the Khmer Rouge. Um, uh, I've been privileged to travel to Palestine and Egypt and Oman and uh, um, uh, throughout Central America, Mexico, um, Thailand, Malaysia, many, many countries. And uh, seeing, seeing the level of poverty that exists for a majority of the population of the earth is so important for our young people to see and to be part of the solution to, uh, to do uh, work that is useful uh, to try to alleviate poverty and war and suffering. Um, one other uh, thing I, I think I would urge young people to do <clears throat> is to have the courage to act on your convictions. Um, have convictions. <laughs> um, uh, find people and communities that support uh, your highest self, your aspiration. Um, I, um, I love that quote um, from Margaret Mead, uh, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, nothing else ever has, or it's the only thing that has. Um, so uh, you do make a difference. You are important. Um, and nothing courageous I've ever done um, has been alone. Um, after our action, there were over 200 similar actions around the country. Uh, many of them aren't widely known, 
uh, because the people weren't all, you know, well known in their communities and supported the way we were. But um, it's possible to see a problem and to really give your heart to finding a solution to that problem. We all have talents and uh, I trust that the young people of this era and any young people who might ever see this interview uh, will be able to, to carry on visions of peace and to act for peace, to make peace, to protect our precious planet into the future. Um, one of the big changes that uh, I've experienced and am still experiencing uh, that is a challenge for me today, and maybe for you, um, is that back in the late 60s, early 70s, we often um, were pretty black and white, dualistic in our thinking. The bad guys were totally bad, you know. We demonized uh, Nixon and Hoover and there were some pretty bad guys out there. <laughs> Reagan, um, the Dow Chemical Company, GE. Dow Chemical is still doing horrific things to destroy uh, the earth um, and to harm people. So corporations really do uh, some terrible things. Um, but we also saw ourselves as the good guys. <laughs> um, and sometimes got a little carried away with that. So one of uh, the, the lessons that I constantly struggle with is um, what Thich Nhat Hanh calls uh, interbeing. That actually, if we have some kind of vision of the world that all people are equal, that all people basically have the same desires and needs for food and shelter and education for their children and a good life. Um, are there better ways that we could communicate this vision and really listen to people who are seem very, very different from us? Um, the, the poem that he wrote, uh, Please Call Me By My True Names, brings this home to me. Uh, it talks about a 12-year-old girl who was a, a boat person, a refugee from Vietnam. And uh, her family uh, was stuck on a boat, uh, uh, not knowing where they were going. And they were attacked by sea pirates who raped her and she jumped off the boat and killed herself. And it's easier to identify with and have compassion for the victim. But he says that we also must have compassion for the sea pirate. Which one of us, given different circumstances, um, poverty, conditions in our lives, might not be that sea pirate. And so looking at my own anger, fear, uh, jealousy, revenge, whatever feelings come up in me, um, and really uh, looking at the past, at the present, and the future, as, as being right here, right now. Um, I think it makes a difference. So I am very dedicated to um, a morning routine that involves about an hour of journaling and writing. Um, Qigong, uh, I would urge young people to take care of these bodies. You might have it till you're 80 or 90 years old. So uh, I'm a, a Qigong teacher. Um, I teach meditation. I uh, have been conducting retreats for women alcoholics 
a meditation retreats for about five and a half years now. And <clears throat> I'm writing a book that I hope my husband and I will be using to uh, uh, help couples with conflicts and anger and difficulties they're having. And these efforts at changing ourselves um, do deepen the compassion that I feel uh, for other people that seem so different from me. Um, uh, when Thich Nhat Hanh was asked after 9-11 what he would do if he had a chance to talk to Osama bin Laden, what would he say? He said, I would listen. One uh, message uh, for young people is that today I really see that I am one with the whole world. Um, we are interconnected. I mean, my mother and my father are right here in my DNA and my waves in my hair. Um, uh, my, my future generations continue me. And if we really have a vision of, of peace in the world, um, in my opinion, it has to be based on love. Not just romantic love, but a kind of love that believes in equality, that it's inclusive, that is compassionate, that is joyful, um, and extends to every living being on earth. Um, bombs, terrorism, war uh, are not a way to stop something like ISIS. It doesn't work. I still firmly believe that love is the answer. That love, true love, is more powerful than any hatred, any fear, any anger, any terrorism that exists on the face of the earth. And the words of uh, John Lennon's Imagine come to my mind. Um, imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. Um, imagine all the people living life in peace. You may say, I'm a dreamer. But I'm not the only one. 